thanks again, everybody, for joining us. Okay, so um, I'm going to do a quick introduction here. One second, sorry. Okay, everybody. So today we have instructor uh, Frank Nicoli with us. Um, this is a Bosca. Um, this is a Bosca webinar, but we we here at Mid Peninsula Water District are sponsoring this this uh, webinar for today. Um, we ask all attendees to please mute their devices. Um, and um, for this presentation, we're we're going to ask that everybody hold their questions until the end of the presentation. And um, we uh, will be recording this. So just a little bit of backstory about Bosca. Uh, Bosca represents the 26 agencies. They include cities, water districts, a water company, and the University um, of Stanford. And they all purchase water wholesale from the Sacramento or the, from the San, San Francisco regional water system. Uh, Bosca member agencies provide 1.8 million uh, water to 1.8 million people and over 40,000 businesses and community organizations in Alameda, Santa Clara, and San Mateo counties. Bosco's goal, high quality supply of water at a fair price. So uh, what we hope people learn from today is um, that out outdoor water use represents the single largest untapped opportunity for water conservation in the Bosco service area. So that is that is the area where people are wasting the most water and that we have the most opportunity um, to save that water. And uh, outdoor water use reduction through the use of water efficient plants and innovative techniques can help conserve water and ensure that the future water supply needs of our communities are met. Um, so just a little bit of uh, information on what we have going on here at Mid Peninsula Water District right now for those of you that are attending that happen to reside within our service area. We have several rebates that we feel like um, can offer a great opportunity to our residents um, and customers to save water and to save a lot of money on their bill. And uh, just overall, one of these right here is the Lombigon. We here at Mid Peninsula pay $4 per square foot of um, of lawn that you replace. So if you uh, if you're interested in that, we definitely recommend you reach out to us. I'll I'll uh, I'll, I'll give you some contact information at the end. Um, on the right, we have our rain barrel rebates. If you go to a local um, Home Depot or Lowe's or hardware appliance store and purchase one of these rebates or these rain barrels and have it installed to water plants or um, other other uh, vegetation throughout the year, um, Mid Peninsula Water District will rebate up to $200 for up to two rain barrels. Um, another of our op other rebate programs, we have the Smart Controller Rebate and Installation Program. This allows your irrigation system at home to be controlled um, through this device and you can monitor it and control it through an app. Um, and it, it'll give you uh, weather updates in real time. And it allows you to um, use your irrigation system in the most efficient way possible. And the optional rain garden is also um, a part of our Lawn Be Gone program. And those who install rain gardens that capture the rain um, will be rebated up to $300. So here are a couple of the other Bosca um, webinars coming up in the future. Um, you can see that we have some pretty interesting topics that I highly suggest everybody check out on their free time. And if you have any information um, about these webinars, you can you can go to the Bosco website. And so um, that's it for my introduction. I'll, I'll go ahead and I'll let um, Frank take it away. Thank you very much. Let's find my PowerPoint. There we go. And... 
All right, today we're going to talk about trees and how they relate to this whole drought situation <laughs> we, we are in. Many people think we are out of the drought. Not true. We are still in the drought uh, and probably will be for some time, although they are saying that La Nina El Nino is flipping and that we will have a significant amount of water coming down this year. So does anyone know what ecosystem services are about? Ecosystem services are um, services that plants and wildlife do that we don't have to pay for. So for example, a tree um, sequesters water, et cetera, uh, sequesters carbon, and what we're finding out is that trees provide a significant amount of ecosystem services. The city of San Jose has done a urban tree canopy assessment. And they plan on installing 100,000 trees in the city of San Jose. And what they found was in their analysis that these trees in the urban forest will provide around $240 million in benefits to the city, which means that they don't have to spend $240 million to get the same amount of benefits that these trees provide. So what do uh, trees provide? Well, they look good. Property values increase when you install trees. Uh, especially in multifamily homes, um, parks, commercial properties, uh, plant trees, because real estate agents have known for a long time that curb appeal sells houses. So when we talk about um, trees, we need to understand that there is something called leaf or LSA, which is the leaf surface area. And that leaf surface area is a real thing. It increases property values. So the more leaves that you have on your property, the more your property is worth. This may be in terms of psychological, or it may be in real um, value to your, to your community. And we'll talk about that in a little more when we talk about how many trees that we've actually lost in California. What do trees provide? Well, urban stormwater runoff. They uh, collect chemicals, oil, gasoline, salt, litter from the surface of roadways and parking lots, keep it from going into our streams, rivers, and oceans. Trees act like mini reservoirs. They control runoff at the source. They reduce runoff by intercepting and holding rainwater uh, on leaves, branches, and bark, and they sequester it in their root system. They increase infiltration and storage of rainwater through their root system, and they reduce soil erosion significantly by slowing rainfall before it hits the soil. What else do they provide? Around your own uh, environment, they modify the clim climate. They conserve building uh, energy. And they do this in three principal ways. Obviously, shading reduces the amount of heat absorbed uh, and stored by the building. Evapotranspiration, which means that as the tree grows, it gives off water liquid water in uh, the form of water vapor, which cools the air, air around your structure, which reduces the amount of air conditioning that's necessary. Tree canopies also slow down wind, thereby reducing the amount of heat loss from a home, especially where conductivity is high. Conductivity in, in terms of glass windows. So a strategically placed tree can increase home energy efficiency. In the summertime, the trees shade on the uh, south and west wall, keeping the building cooler. In wintertime, it allows the sun to strike the uh, southern side of the building, which can warm the interior spaces. So trees have a real value. 
Air pollution is a serious health threat, especially those who are susceptible to asthma, coughing, headaches, respiratory uh, and heart disease, and even cancer. Over 150 million people live in areas where ozone levels violate federal air quality standards, and more than 100 million people are impacted when dust and other particulate level levels are considered unhealthy. Trees help by absorbing pollutants like ozone, nitrogen dioxide, and sulfur dioxide. They actually use these in their photosynthetic processes. They intercept particulate matter like dust, ash, and smoke. They release oxygen through photosynthesis. They lower air temperatures, which can reduce the production of ozone. And they reduce energy use and subsequent pollution emissions from power plants. The trees themselves have a significant amount of value because they generate um, a significant amount of oxygen and they sequester carbon dioxide. So an average tree will uh, sequester the amount of carbon dioxide produced by a mid-sized uh, uh, sedan driving 12,000 miles which amounts to about 11,000 pounds of carbon dioxide a year. So if you took a flight from, uh, from uh, San Francisco to Los Angeles, that plane is dumping 1,400 pounds of carbon dioxide per passenger into the air. Trees can have an impact by reducing this atmospheric carbon dioxide in two primary ways. They lock the carbon dioxide up they actually split the carbon dioxide model or molecule. They give off oxygen and they use the carbon to build roots, trunks, and stems and leaves. So when we look at trees, they provide a significant amount of value to us. So if we look at this model here, what do they provide? Um, they actually provide about $191 per tree per month if the tree is cared for and grows to uh, 23 inches breast height diameter. BDH is what that term means. So this is the value of an urban tree. One public uh, tree 40 years after planting, the annual benefits 129 uh, bucks. It costs 28 bucks to manage that tree with an annual net benefit of $101. So over 40 years, 100 large public trees will net uh, $403,400 in uh, value. So there is a real value to trees and, and most people don't think about that. They think about uh, other things when it comes to trees on their property. In the drought of 76, 77, um, which was a significant drought, uh, after that, they produced a very large report, um, which was about 18 inches thick. And it was called the 1976, 1977 California Drought Review. They produced it, they didn't enact it, which was a significant mistake considering we've had two very real droughts since then. So how many trees have we lost in the 76, 77 drought? Well, we lost 7.7 .7 million trees in two years, which equates to 3 billion 465 million pounds of carbon, uh, carbon dioxide added to the atmosphere. You multiply that by the $200 and we're looking at 1 billion or 1 trillion 540,000 um, dollars uh, in real dollars that we lost due to the 76, 77 drought. So seven point seven million trees times 200 bucks there's your there's your um, 
uh, number. And this was in the 76, 77 drought. The remaining trees lost 68 to 74% uh, of their total volume. Insects and disease complexes killed 67% of these trees. And borers were responsible for the most tree deaths. Why does that, why do we care about that? Well, we're going to talk about that in just a minute. Diseases were primarily dwarf mistletoe and root diseases. So, how many in 2023? In this last drought, we've lost 2.5 billion trees. Billion. Which means that the cities in California have had to pono, pony up $504 trillion in ecosystem services value. That's a big number. And I can bet that if you ask Brandon what one of the most significant things he deals with every day, it's budget. They don't have the money to do this. And so there is a significant reliance on the urban landscape to take up the slack of these trees that we have lost. That's just the start. After a drought for the next two years after a drought ends, and we haven't seen the end of this drought yet, we are on track to lose a huge amount of trees to insects, mistletoe, and root diseases. Um, when, if you drive to Tahoe, you're seeing that loss. You can look to the left and to the right on your way to Tahoe and see the significant loss of trees that are happening uh, currently in California. And then we have this little thing called fire. In the last drought, forest fires accounted for $34.3 billion. So you add that to the trillion dollar number, California is in big trouble, whether you know it or not. We are starting to look a lot like Arizona or Texas. We're losing our trees. We're losing the reason that California is known uh, for its beauty. When we look at turf views versus trees, since this is all about drought, we need to look about inputs versus uh, outputs. So the inputs, solar energy, precipitation, nutrients in rain and dust, atmospheric carbon dioxide, those are your inputs. Um, when we look at the inputs versus outputs, the temperate forests will, on the average, store 17.637 pounds of carbon per square meter of plant material. When you compare that to turf, turf is a net 25 loss. Do you want to breathe? or not. You get to breathe, you don't breathe. It's really that simple, people. Trees are the reason that you breathe today. Lawns take much more energy than they give back. It's real simple when you look at the root system uh, and the shoot system of the turf and look at the root system and shoot system of a forest. A root shoot system in a in turf might be eight inches. Root shoot system in trees or in a forest system, 40 or 50 feet. Which one does better? So the consequences of turf, less biological diversity, which means no birds. Birds don't care about turf. Birds don't get food from turf, trees feed birds, 
Local plants are displaced by turf grasses and turf adapted animals and microbes. They increase, they contribute to global warming. They increase stress on municipal water supplies. They increase municipal solid waste problems. The pest, pesticides used on turf contaminates food chains. Pesticides on lawns can actually threaten human health, including uh, carcinogens, and it disrupts the biology of neighboring surface waters. You got to cut this stuff so it's using fossil fuel. So turf is a big loser. It's time to lose turf. It's time to say goodbye uh, to turf and look for other crops. You can plant trees in turf, and there are a number of trees that will work. But trees work in conjunction with other plants at their base and are much more efficient when they form relationships with plants around them. Trees like a fungal environment. Lawn likes it bacterial. When you put a tree in a lawn, you're automatically trying to combine two particular types of environments that just don't work well together. So it's better to have trees, shrubs together than trees and turf together. So what do, what do we need to expect when we uh, deal with uh, uh, this drought and trees? Well, we can expect to lose uh, a lot of our trees to mistletoe. When we look at insects and diseases, their job is to take down plants that are stressed. That's what they get paid to do. So you can't blame mistletoe for eating a tree. Can't do it, because that's what it gets paid to do. If that tree is stressed and you get mistletoe on it and it takes the tree out, um, the tree should have been cared for so that the mistletoe doesn't uh, take over a tree. So here's mistletoe on an ash. And this mistletoe absorbs both water and uh, mineral nutrients from the host trees. It's a parasite. And this is what you need to do. You need to cut it out and then wrap it in blast, black plastic so that it does not re regrow. Um, and you need to cut it into this branch significantly. On some branches, you need to cut anywhere from six uh, inches to a foot into the branch and then wrap it with the black plastic so it doesn't regrow. The mistletoe will die within a couple of years um, without uh, light, and then you can remove the black plastic. Like our own selves, prevention is the key here. If you take care of these trees, you're gonna prevent this mistletoe from taking a foothold and you're gonna have a healthy tree which can fight this mistletoe infection uh, significantly. When we talk about trees, we talk about resistant, susceptible, or tolerant. Some tree species appear to be resistant to broadleaf mistletoe. Others are susceptible and others just tolerate it. And so selecting a tree for your garden um, actually defines your future maintenance costs. You don't select a tree purely by its aesthetics. You need to think about 5, 10, and 15 years down the line and what this tree is going to cost you in future self. So let's talk about the numbers. Um, and I'm going to use the 76, 77 drought as an example of what happened to trees. <clears throat> so in the 76-77 drought, mistletoe and insects combined killed 51% of the trees. Root diseases and mistletoe killed 12%. Root diseases and insects, only 4%. Diseases, 14%. Insects, 
with some type of injury, 4%. Insects, no injury, 13%. And 2% were other causes. So let's talk about bugs for a bit. The poster child of tree insects is by far and away the bark beetles. The bark beetles sense a stressed plant. And once they sense that uh, stress plant, they attack it. Their job is to take down trees to recycle the nutrients that the tree sequestered during its lifetime. The turpentine bark beetle, the engraver beetle, um, has over 600 species that it attacks in the United States and about 200 species of trees in California. If you look into the uh, Tajo Basin or the area around San Bernardino, LA Basin, you're seeing significant damage to the pine uh, trees in that area due to the bark beetles. We also have cedar and cypress bark beetles that attack arborvitaes, cypress, junipers, redwoods. The fir engraver bark beetle attacks white and red fir. Oak uh, is attacked by ambrosia beetles, <clears throat> uh, which also goes after the California buckeye and the tan bark oak. We are also seeing shot hole damage in the LA area that is slowly moving up into the San Francisco Bay Area. So this shot hole um, attacks uh, trees and it actually plants a fungus which is detrimental to trees that feeds its young. It's a very interesting uh, concept. Most of the time the bark beetles attack dead trees. This particular character is attacking healthy trees or semi-healthy trees. So we are uh, under the scourge of bark beetles currently, and they're doing a lot of damage. So this is an ad adult female shot hole borers. And they have a, um, uh, a large mandible that can chew through wood. Uh, easy. These mandibles are made for chewing. This is a red turpentine beetle. And this is a, an adult five-spined Ips beetle. And this is what it does. So this is red turpentine bark beetle frass at the base of a pine tree. Whenever you think you have issues with your trees, you always look to the base. And if you see frass, which is a um, fancy name for bug poop, um, you uh, can bet that you have some issues with bark beetles. So these are the galleries that bark beetles produce. They uh, adult lays its eggs within the, uh, under the cadmium layer of the tree. And then the larva hatch out and they bore their way to the surface. So these are out holes, not in holes. And these were made by an Ips engraver beetle. This is um, a gallery by Ips engraver beetle uh, damage. So what these beetles do is they weaken to the point where they take it down and then other insects come in and finish the job. Termite being one of the, um, one of the ones that comes after. So bark beetles mine the inner bark uh, under the phloem cambial region on twigs, branches, trunks, shrub, uh, and uh, trunks of trees and shrubs. The activity often uh, causes the tree to produce sap. And what this sap is trying to do is push this bark beetle back out. Sap is produced in a lot of the conifers and in the hardwoods like elm and walnut. This sap 
flow or pitch tube is designed to protect the tree from damage from the bark beetles. If the tree is weak, it can't produce this sap. Um, and so that means that any type of tree that you have in the landscape is subject to attack by insects, including bark beetles, if in fact it is weak. A healthy tree is able to fight off a bark beetle attack. We're going to talk about how to manage a healthy tree in, in, in just a bit. So the best cultural practices for any plant is to improve the health of the tree. It, it's really that simple. And we're going to talk about how to do that in, in, in just a bit. So this is a uh, frass under a uh, Monterey pine. And um, when you start to see this, it's a warning sign that you need to act or you're gonna lose that tree. Because the bark beetles live in protected habitat between the bark, you can't control them with insecticides. Can't. Um, if the main trunk is extensively attacked by bark beetles, the entire uh, plant should be removed. Um, if the tree is left, then the population of the bark beetles will grow and it will attack other plants within the garden once it finishes with the host that it's currently living in. Unattacked, un unattacked trees nearby are weakened and stressed by other factors. So once you have this problem, you want uh, to get a qualified arborist out to diagnose the problem and get the plant out as soon as possible. If you have a large pine tree, for example, it will cost you $10,000 to get that pine tree out. So when I emphasize prevention, I really mean that it's gonna tap your, uh, your pocketbook if you're not taking care of those trees. Pine trees are difficult to get out. You wanna reduce tree stress. You want to remove um, uh, plants around the trees that are not healthy because they're actually taking from the health of the tree. You want to prevent by uh, avoiding injuries to the roots and the trunks. You want to avoid soil compaction. So if you're doing construction on your property, Contractors love to park under the shade of your trees. You can't let them do that because it's going to cause damage to that root system that you won't see for nine to 10 months after the contractor leaves. Sun scald. You want to protect the, the plant from sun scald. If you're trenching uh, to put in an irrigation system, don't trench through the roots of these trees. Hand dig it, don't use a machine. Irrigation may be the most important preventive measure during dry summer months and especially in drought years. Many of the California natives are drought tolerant if they get rain in the winter time. If they do not get rain, you are the rain. You need to irrigate. And we're going to talk about how to irrigate in just a bit. Um, susceptible trees, if you've got a lot of susceptible trees on your property, they should be thinned um, to increase the remaining tree's vigor and health and their ability to withstand attack from insects and diseases. Irrigate where it's appropriate. Um, water should penetrate into the soil about one foot below the surface on all your trees. And that is a low and slow application of water. If in fact you do have infested limbs, remove them. 
dispose of those uh, those limbs. Don't keep them on site as firewood. Get them off site. If you do want to keep them on uh, site as firewood, then you want to make sure that you get them under clear plastic, not black plastic, clear plastic. The difference is under black plastic, the temperature will raise to 105 degrees. Under clear plastic, the temperature in that area will rise to 140 degrees. And so that you'll solarize and kill any of the insects that are left in these um, in these wood piles. You wanna make sure that you uh, thoroughly see the edges of these, uh, these plastic piles to prevent the beetles from escaping. You wanna cook them. Elm bark beetles are also susceptible to uh, uh, to damaging um, elm trees, specifically in um, in drought years. Um, this is a plant that's under stress. When a plant is under stress, the first thing it does is it closes its stomata. Photosynthesis shuts down. The leaves begin to droop, roll. Older leaves may begin to yellow and drop. They're doing this because they're trying to reduce water loss. The reduced amount of tissue <clears throat> decreases the amount of water loss. If the water loss continues, the edges of the leaves will turn yellow and then brown. And they usually start at the leaf tips and work their way down to the leaf. Plants that are in their first year following installation are at highest risk. So you want to make sure that um, you're irrigating new plants during the first year so they do not become susceptible to water stress, which makes them susceptible to um, diseases and insects. In heavy clay soils, we have a few of those around here, you want to make sure that you're irrigating properly so that the soil is not waterlogged. <laughs> Waterlog is just about as bad as no water at all. Plants need 25% of air in the soil. And if a soil is anaerobic because it's um, waterlogged, then you're going to have um, a disease process starting in the tree, including Phytophthora, Armillaria, Verticillium, and other waterborne disease, Botryosphaeria. Um, so you need to be careful about the amount of water that you're putting out there. So this is a sign of Armillaria malia. These are called honey mushrooms. After a drought, Oaks and other trees are very susceptible to armillaria. And they are usually indicative of these honey mushrooms. This is a primary indicator, or this is a secondary in indicator of a primary infection. So the infection is in the tree. This is just an indicator of that infection. It's like you having a sore throat. Well, what is it? Is it COVID? Is it the flu? Is it a common cold? What is it? Well, that's what these um, mushrooms are telling you. You got a problem. You just don't know what the problem um, uh, might be. Plants, especially in their first year following compact, uh, co uh, transplant or installation are at their highest risk. So you need to make sure that they're watered properly. This is our malaria, and these are the, um, uh, this is our malaria malia, and these are rhizomorphs, which literally means root forms, and they are usually uh, under the bark of the tree. They're, they look like um, shoelaces, and it is a, a sign of a fungal hyphae. Uh, and you've got a disease process working in, in the plant material. Here's another picture of it. 
<clears throat> these are white mycelial mats, and they're marked by uh, fan-like striations. And uh, these mats decompose the, the tree. Their job, fungus's job, is to eat uh, large tissue, <clears throat> and that's what they're doing. Um, the other problem that we see with drought stress trees, especially maples, is verticillium wilt. Verticillium wilt enters the tree through um, roots, and this soil-borne pathogen penetrates through the vascular tissues that carry moisture and nutrients, and the um, plant itself becomes um, unhealthy. You start to see parts of the tree dying off. You may not see the whole tree dying off, but you're going to see parts of it dying off. If you scrape the bark away, you're going to see this discoloration underneath the bark. And this discoloration is the tree's attempt to compartmentalize off the infection. Verticillium symptoms are usually confined to one side of the in infected tree. So one side of the tree is dead and the other uh, side of the tree is healthy. When we see verticillium, we can apply a potassium rich fertilizer, increase the amount of irrigation to the tree to help boost the tree's Im immune system so it slows the infections spread um, into the tree. Once the tree is beyond saving, remove it because the tree has become an incubator for verticillium, which could affect your other plants. So eventually verticillium is going to uh, kill that maple tree. There is no way that you can completely prevent it. You might get another four or five years <clears throat> out of that plant, but eventually it's going to kill it. Um, so following a drought, you want to make sure that you have a consistent water schedule um, before and after dry spells to protect your trees from drought-related wilt. Water the trees at or beyond the drip line. So everyone has this fantasy that the drip line of the tree, uh, where the canopy ends, is where the root system ends. It's actually three times that. So if I look at this particular tree, and it's six foot from the uh, base of the tree to the edge of the canopy, that means the root systems are extending out 18 feet. And so you need to protect that root system from compaction. You need to make sure that it's adequately irrigated. And you need to make sure that there are um, uh, nutrients for these particular uh, trees so they do not become susceptible to uh, diseases and insects. <laughs> With... <laughs> Sorry about that. I've been teaching since 8 o'clock this morning, so my, my voice is shot. So on maple trees, this uh, staining is uh, pretty indicative of um, verticillium. You get maple trees that look like this. Part of the tree is dead. The rest of the tree is healthy. Here's another picture of a maple tree in a condominium complex. Half the tree is dead. Half of it is alive half the tree dead, half alive. So what kind of conclusions can we make about um, these particular trees? And then we'll get into some other um, um, topics. One of the biggest problems with many trees is overwatering. Overwatering is just as bad as underwatering because the soil is waterlogged. Um, how much water do you put into a plant? Well, take a soil probe and pull a soil core out 
see how wet it is. These um, coring devices are inexpensive. If you don't have one, you can take a screwdriver and just kind of dig around in the soil and look down into the soil and see how much moisture is in there. But for 30 bucks <laughs> for a soil probe, uh, you can save a lot of trees. So invest in them uh, and then use them uh, to wisely uh, check your uh, plants for damage. Uh, when you are using your soil probes, you're going to get a core. This core is going to tell you a couple of things. It's going to tell you how deep your roots are going. It's going to give you an indication whether there's disease or damaged roots in your uh, soil. It's going to show whether there's insects that are in the soil. And one of the most um, diabolical insects out there are ants. Because ants will pick up insects like aphids, whitefly, and carry them down into the ground and place them on the roots of your plants because they want the aphids and whitefly, et cetera, to eat the roots of your plants so that they can get the honeydew that's produced by the excess carbohydrates of the aphids. So if you've got ants, you need to get them under control in your garden so that the ants don't carry insects into the ground, <clears throat> which decreases your root system, which increases the drought stress on the tree or plant, which will cause it to go into decline, which will cause the insects or a disease to attack it. So a simple little device like a soil probe can save you a lot of headache and give you a scientific, reasonably scientific view of what is going on at the root system and in the soil of your, um, of your plants. If you squeeze this in water, it comes dripping out of this soil, you're overwatering. If you squeeze it and a little water comes out, you're good. Um, and don't forget to smell this. If it smells rancid, it is rancid. Plants living in a rancid environment don't do well, um, as well as us. We don't like living in a rancid environment, so why should our plants? <clears throat> Understand your plant. What is your plant telling you? Plants talk to you. They show you what they're missing. They change color. The leaves droop. The veins pop out. The leaves will actually turn themselves vertically to reduce their exposure to the sun. A tree will tell you um, different um, problems it is having. Stand there and watch your tree. Go out and, and look at your plants and, and, and see what they're telling you. Uh, the day after you water uh, your landscape, walk outside and look at it and then compare that to the day before you water your landscape. What, what's the difference? Look at plants that are diseased in your garden or plants that are giving you nothing but uh, problems. Look at your trees. This is an excellent time to begin looking at your trees. The uh, atmospheric river that we got this past February did some significant damage to the urban forest because people weren't looking at their trees. Look up. Do you have a large sail effect in your trees? Do you have damaged uh, limbs up in that tree? If we get a big rainstorm and a big windstorm, that damaged limb can come down and damage your property, your car, your house, or kill someone. We did have some people uh, killed during that last atmospheric river because the trees were um, were coming down or uh, limbs in the trees were um, also coming down. So you wanna look at your trees 
and then make decisions about what type of maintenance they need. Call a qualified arborist. Get somebody out there that knows what they're doing. Check their credentials. You can go to the AS or the um, ISA, International Society of Arborists website, and check the credentials of your arborist. You don't want to trust your Mercedes tree to a shade tree mechanic. You want to get somebody out there that knows what they're doing to take care of those trees. Compaction. Compaction causes significant damage to trees because it uh, air can't live in a compacted soil. If you're doing remodeling on your property or if you're uh, just uh, putting in a pathway, take measures that you don't compact these trees. You can uh, look uh, up something called engineered gravel or engineered soil. If you're putting in a sidewalk, Use engineered soil so you don't have this compaction and the roots of the plants can live in this engineered soil under your sidewalk without damaging your sidewalk. If you do have damage due to compaction, the process takes about nine months before you notice the canopy of the tree going into decline. So I've worked with clients who have um, had a remodel done. The contractors parked under the trees, caused a significant amount of compaction. And nine months later, their trees were dying and they couldn't understand why. And so we did a forensic analysis of these uh, situations to understand what um, went on there. There's another compacted tree area. If you do have compaction, they can do what is called a radial trench. They'll uh, dig these trenches, fill them with compost, and relieve that compaction. Compost is, is key. When we're dealing with drought-stressed trees or trees that are healthy that you want to keep healthy, make sure you mulch. Mulch is key. Don't mulch around the base of the tree, mulch around the root system of the tree. So you wanna see these um, flares on a tree. You don't wanna cover them up with mulch. If you cover them with mulch or you cover them with soil, then the tree begins to produce a secondary root system that secondary root system is usually responsible for producing girdling roots, which will cut the tree in half. So don't put the mulch directly up to the trunk of the tree. Get it away from it. Do something like this. <clears throat> don't use this. Don't do that. I see so many people say, oh, it's so ugly out there. And they put this rock in. This rock is not mulch. During the day, the rock heats up. At night, the um, heat passes down into the soil, which causes an increase in fungal activity, which will attack your tree. And in five years, you're gonna lose that tree. You see this all the time on ornamental landscapes because people think it's ugly and rocks will look so pretty around the tree. It's just easier not to spend the money on the rocks and cut the tree down. Just do it just because you're going to end up doing that anyway. So save, save yourself the money of the mulch, the rock mulch, and just cut the tree down today and get it over with. Buckets in the shower, absolutely. Carry that water outside and water your plants, water your trees. Shower with a friend, maybe. I wanna take some time to answer some questions of those who are patient, patiently waiting for me to end. Questions, Brendan? Yeah, well, uh, I'll open up the floor for questions uh, for a moment. We'll see if we get any takers. And um, 
If not, I have a couple of my own questions for you. So I'll okay. give everybody a, a quick second. Ask questions. Don't hesitate. Citrus trees got problems with citrus. Citrus are in in a stressful mode right now. Uh, zinc and, and iron are needed. They can't photosynthesize. Citrus should be watered once a week, deep, not every other day. Pine trees, once a week, deep. Redwood trees, four times a week, deep. Oaks, never in the summer, always during the rainy season. Okay, well, I'll go ahead and I'll start with a question of my own. Um, I feel like I know the answer to this, but a lot of people may not. Um, can you overwater a tree in a severe drought? Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah, overwatering is one of the biggest issues that we see. It's like chicken soup. More is better. The problem with overwatering is that your um, your oxygen levels drop in this uh, in the in the soil profile, and it's worse in clay soil because these clay soils begin to compact. Clay soils are the worst. If you live near Sand Hill Road, that's called Sand Hill Road for a reason, and water. Um, it's hard to overwater plants on Sand Hill Road. If you're down on the peninsula, it's real easy to overwater. The amount of water uh, uh, that a plant needs is is not rocket science. It's a little more complicated than that, but it's easy to tell if you get a soil probe. Soil probe costs you thirty bucks. That will save you uh, money uh, in the long run with your water bill and losing plant materials. So buy a soil probe, they're cheap. Frank, it looks like we got a question from one of our attendees. Um, they ask, is there a type of tree species that attracts birds more than others? Absolutely, oaks, number one. And the reason is that what do baby birds eat? They eat caterpillars. Baby birds can't eat seeds. And so you want to put in oaks. Oaks are home to 537 species of caterpillar in our area. That's right, 537 species of caterpillars. An average bird, um, a mated pair, makes the trip to the baby bird nest every three minutes. And they are capturing anywhere from five to 6,000 caterpillars a day. So you want to make sure that you get a tree that um, is host to caterpillars and other insects because birds will only come if there is food for them to eat. Oaks, number one, plums, peaches, those types of trees also uh, will attract caterpillars. Willows attract caterpillars. Don't do crepe myrtles, crepe myrtles. I call crepe myrtles crap myrtles for a reason. They uh, take more than they give. They're pretty, but they don't do anything for the uh, urban environment. And birds won't uh, are not even close to attracted to, cra to cra crepe myrtles. Well, it looks like we have another question within our chat. Um, the attendee asks, I have a persimmon tree and a magnolia tree. Both are growing, growing and leaning to the left. There are more limbs on the left side of the tree than the right side of the tree. How do I take care of this? Should I trim some of the limbs on the left side to balance the tree out? The tree is actually balancing itself out. So if, if magnolia is planted on the south and west side, um, it's in trouble. So magnolias are never planted on, on south or west because that's the hottest part of the garden. North and east are where magnolias should be planted. Persimmons like sun and water. Um, trimming a persimmon to balance it out, yes, you can. You wanna limit the amount of fruit of, that a persimmon is producing anyway. If it gets too much of a fruit load, it's taking a lot of uh, metabolic energy from the plant itself and causing the plant to go into decline. 
magnolias, <clears throat> if it's a deciduous magnolia, you only prune that in the winter time. If it's a evergreen magnolia, you can prune that most of the year. Best time to do it is early spring or uh, fall because uh, of the uh, they they will they will sometimes express a lot of sap if if the sap is running hard when the tree is hot. Okay. Um, so another another question for myself. Um, is there a negative, is there a native species of tree that you would not recommend if someone is trying to save water? Uh, that's actually a great question. So not all native plants are drought tolerant. The riparian species, and these are trees that live near creeks and rivers, need to live near a creek and a river. Um, trees like poplars, willows, uh, they will actually dip their uh, roots into the creek or river and pull water out. They're not even close to drought tolerant uh, plants. So you can go to the California Native Plant Society and Google riparian trees and it was going to give you a list of trees that are not even close to drought tolerant. It'll actually give you plants that are not even close to drought tolerant. Red twig dogwood, not drought tolerant. It likes a wet spot and it likes a lot of water. Redwood trees. Redwood trees are water hogs. They need about a hundred gallons of water a day um, to survive. And the bigger they get, the more water they need. And so they actually will go after your water lines. Um, if they're if if they're healthy, they'll attack your water lines easily. Well, thank you for that answering that. Um, we have another question within the uh, within the chat. Um, the attendee asks, "When should you prune an apricot tree? Is it too late to do so now?" No, we're coming into apricot pruning time right now. Be careful of apricots, peaches, and any other stone fruit that you might have. They It takes two years for them to produce a fruiting spur. And so when you're pruning, you want to look for the pruning uh, spurs and don't remove them. I've had clients who have, who have asked, well, I didn't get any apricots this year or last year. What, what's the matter with my tree? Well, somebody went in and improperly pruned it. And mm. it's trying to reestablish this fruiting spurs. <laughs> so you want to wait till the tree loses all of its leaves. Then you can see the structure of the tree. There's a number of ways that you can prune these trees. You can uh, vase prune them so you get more fruit. So if you look at the way the growers are pruning them, they're opening them up to get more sunlight in so that more leaves are exposed to the sun, which gives them more fruit. The other cultural requirement of these trees is that you want to make sure that you apply at least two or three applications of dormant spray so that you don't get peach leaf curl. If in fact you forget and don't apply peach leaf curl and you get peach leaf curl, then you're going to apply kelp, liquid kelp, and the new growth will come out clean and the old peach leaf curl growth will drop off. But it's better to be preventive. Um, prevention is better than um, a prophylactic solution uh, after the fact. Okay. Um, um, another question for myself. Um, for some of the homeowners in the area, how close would you suggest they go about planting a tree, an average size tree, um, within distance to their home? Ooh. Mm -hmm. um, it's going to really depend on the tree. I would never put a redwood near my tree, never put a podocarpus. Um, in the literature, you can find out information about whether it has an aggressive root system. Trees that are riparian, that use a lot of water, have a very aggressive root system. 
and they will tear up your house. They will lift the foundation. They will lift uh, uh, sidewalks. They'll crack a swimming pool. No problem. Um, I would, um, if a tree is going to get 80 feet tall, I would love to see it 25 feet away from your house. If a tree is getting six feet tall, I would put it four or five feet away from the house. So the height of the tree is going to determine the size of the root system, which is going to determine the amount of damage that you're going to do to your house. Okay. Um, on average, I know, it, I know it depends varying on the species, but on average, how long would you say trees can go without water? Um, trees usually sequester about five years of carbohydrates, which means that a, a tree with a full load of, of uh, reserve can go five years. That doesn't mean the tree is going to look good, or it does not mean the tree is, is going to be uh, immune from disease or insects. It just means that it's going to survive. So you look at oak, oak trees in the wild, as long as we get our uh, rainy uh, season, they will soak up as much water as they can and sequester it in their root systems, increase their reserve, and uh, they can go uh, a time without um, without irrigation. So if you look up on 280, some of those oaks up there are still looking really good, even though we're in seventh year of a drought. They're still looking pretty good. Redwood trees, on the other hand, not so good. Uh, yeah. Tops are dying out. Birch trees, tops are dying out. So they need a lot more water than those oaks. So it's, it, as you said, it is species de dependent, but it's all going to depend on the amount of reserves that the tree has. Mm -hmm. So we have another question was in our chat. Um, one of the attendees asks, um, are the native big leaf maple trees riparian? Mm. Um. So Acer macrophyllums live in a redwood forest. That's their natural habitat. Um, they uh, are not significantly, they're not considered riparian, but since they have a relationship with redwoods, which need a lot of water, they also need a lot of water. Okay. Acer macrophyllums are also aggressive with their root systems. Um, almost all acers, except for the acer palmatum, the Japanese maple, have an aggressive root system. And so if I'm putting maples in and around my property, I want to make sure that I'm not anywhere near infrastructure. No water lines, no uh, sewer, uh, no foundations, no sidewalks. I want to keep them away from them. Acer macrophyllum is a gorgeous plant. It is susceptible to verticillium. So you want to make sure you keep that thing as healthy as possible, which means you're going to irrigate. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> another question for myself. Oh, well, I guess it's not much of a question, but I was just, I was hoping you could just talk more on this topic. Um how long should one soak their tree roots in comparison to um, like using a hose compared to your sprinkler system? So and what are the go ahead? Yeah, what 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 would you say the benefits of soaking a tree root with a hose and laying it next to on top of the roots? Um, what would you say the benefits of that are? over watering it with your regular irrigation sprinkler system? A regular irrigation sprinkler system does not produce enough water to adequately irrigate a tree. So most, um, if you're gonna be installing trees in your landscape, you need to install bubblers and not rely on a uh, spray system. They just don't produce enough water. A spray system will produce anywhere from 0.45 to 1.75 um, gallons 
per minute of water, which means that I've got a, if I've got a redwood tree, for example, and it's looking for a hundred gallons, if I'm irrigating with my irrigation system and I'm doing shrubs and trees at the same time, I need to run that system for a hundred minutes to get that hundred gallons to that particular tree. At that point, my plants are anaerobic. My soil is anaerobic, but the redwood tree is happy. So laying a hose out there is the best way. Uh, you know, as, especially if you're deep watering, turn on your oven timer or use your phone timer. Set it for an hour. Lay the hose out there on a slow trickle and deep water these these trees. They love that. Um, another question from our chat. How close would you suggest planting a valley oak to your home? Well, a valley oak wants to get anywhere from 40 to 60 feet wide. Um, and so you got to have a pretty good size estate to have a valley oak out there. The first few years, they grow slow, but then they begin to leap. And once they begin to leap and spread out, um, you're going to have a maintenance issue on your hand. Your gutters are going to be loaded with leaves. Um, you're uh, going to have to prune it away from the house. You're not going to have any real significant damage from uh, root systems. They don't work that way. They're more of a, well, when they first go in, they're a tap root. They lose that tap root and then they form a fibrous root. But I would uh, I would be careful of Balabalio. Gorgeous plant, but you got to have the size of yard to uh, be able to uh, manage that that tree. It's all about your future maintenance. You know, whenever you put a plant in, you need to think what my future maintenance is. If I put that valley oak in, my future maintenance is going to be high. Do I want that? Um. Another question from the chat, I believe probably the same person. Um, I think this depends on the size of the yard, but uh, the attendee asks, so if they're ruling out the valley oak, what would you say is the best oak for their yard? Yeah, and like I said, I think it depends on the size of their yard. Uh, there's some smaller oaks that uh, do quite well. Uh, the blue oak does all right. Um, and I may not even go with an oak species. I may go with something like a Prunus alisifolia, which is a oak-like plant. It doesn't get as big as an oak, but it has the essence of the oak. So Prunus alisifolia or Prunus alisifolia catalina. Um, and these plants uh, give you the feeling of an oak, but they're not going to get 60 feet tall. Uh, easy to control them, 25 feet. Beautiful plant. Uh, they flower. They have a spike-like flower that's uh, very fragrant. And the leaves are very attractive. So I may not even go with an oak at all. Okay. That's good advice, I guess. Um, so I, I've answered all the questions I had on hand. Um, so I guess we'll just keep seeing what comes in through the chat. Um, okay. The uh, attendee asked, would you suggest a scrub oak? Uh, I mean, you can plant an oak from an acorn. I mean, technically that is a scrub oak or a, a plant that just germinates because a bird brought the acorn into your garden. Um, a scrub oak is going to get big too. So I don't think I would I would go with a scrub oak. As and again, size of your yard. How big is your yard? Um, another question from our chat. Um, what time of what type of dormant spray um, to use for peaches? Is copper fungicide good at dormant spray? Yeah, you can use copper. Um, if you go to the UCIPM website. Uh, and uh, uh, put in dormant spray, they're going to give you a number of options. A lot of people don't like the copper spray um, because they 
it's it, it does have a, a heavy metal in it. I found it to be very effective. Bordeaux is one that a lot of people use. Uh, what's the one that we were using? It's a white uh, color. Oh, I can't remember the name of it, but we've we've used a white one before. It's it's very good. But I would go to the UCIPM website and and look it up. Uh, they have a, a number of options in there, including organic options. Okay, so um, looks like we're about to wind down towards the end of our chat here with Frank. Um, if anybody has any other questions, feel free to get them in. I'll give them a second, Frank. No problem. Looks like we got one. Um, would pardon my uh, my pronunciation of this? Would Garia elliptica work in a small garden as an oak substitute? Garia is a very versatile plant. You can espalier it. You can keep it low. There's a couple of low growing cultivars of Garia that uh, work quite well. It's a beautiful plant. Uh, James Roof is a real good cultivar. EV Case is a good cultivar. Um, they're not going to get huge. Uh, they're easy to control, and they're beautiful plants. Uh, I I really like uh, uh, Garia. It's a it's a good uh, good plant. I I would, yeah, I wouldn't hesitate to put that in my garden for certain. Okay. Okay. Looks like everybody's gotten all the questions they needed to get answered in. So uh, I just want to, I want to thank Frank and I want to thank everybody that's attended tonight. Um, I feel like we've all, we've all gained some great knowledge on trees and their maintenance. And um, I just want to encourage everybody that if you do live within the, the service area of mid peninsula water district, that you, um, that you reach out and, take advantage of the great rebate offers that we have right now um, that can help you save water and um, money on your, your monthly bills. Lots of money. Yeah. Well, I appreciate, I appreciate uh, you hosting us tonight. And uh, if anybody has any questions, uh, get them to Brandon and he can get them over to me and I'll answer them. Sounds good, Frank. I'll make right. sure to do that. Yeah. Brandon S at midpeninsulawater.org. That's my email address. If anybody has any other questions, feel free to, to reach out. Thanks again, Frank. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Have a good night. See you in the garden.